Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 21st session of the Med AI Group Exchange Sessions. This week, we have um, CE Tang here with us um, from Stanford to lead a discussion on graph based modeling in computational pathology. C is currently a PhD candidate at Stanford in the Department of Electrical Engineering and advised by Daniel Rubin. Her uh, research aims to leverage the structure in medical data to better develop um, medical machine learning models and enable uh, novel scientific discovery. She's also interested in enhancing the human interpretability and the clinical utility of such um, algorithms. So thanks C for joining us today. And before we start, do you have any preferences on how you'd like to take questions? Yeah, feel free to interrupt me at any point. Awesome. Okay, so let's try to make this session as interactive as possible. And without further ado, let me hand it over to C. Okay, thanks Nandita for introducing me. <laughs> um, yeah, so today I'm going to uh, give a general club discussion on graph-based modeling in computational pathology. So the outline of my talk is, um, I will first introduce um, graph neural networks and computational pathology, as well as a brief uh, motivation behind graph-based modeling in computational pathology. And then I will discuss three papers in more details, as well as my personal takeaways in this field. So there are many uh, graph structure data in the real world, such as social network, neural networks, brain networks, and molecules. And graph neural networks are a powerful tool that can represent complex graph structures in this uh, graph structure data. So for example, if we assuming we have an input graph like this and our target node is A, there are two main components in the GNN layer. First, um, it aggregates the messages from neighbors of this node A um, using an aggregate function. And then it combines the message of the neighbors as well as the, uh, this node's uh, own embedding from the previous layer to form an, a, an updated embedding for the next layer. So briefly speaking, there are two kinds of graph neural networks. The first one is spectral-based graph neural network, which applies graph convolutions in the spectral domain of the graph Laplace matrix. So for example, a graph convolutional network, which, is, uh, which approximates first order approximation of localized spectral filters to um, perform the convolution. However, the drawback of this kind of uh, spectral graph neural network is that it usually requires storing the whole graph uh, adjacency matrix, which could be computationally inefficient. And it was also introduced for transductive setting. Another type of graph neural network is spatial graph neural network, which applies graph convolutions to the spatial domain defined by the graph topology. So one example is graph sage, which samples a fixed number of neighborhoods for each node and aggregates along these neighborhoods. And there's also graph attention network, which allows a node to attend to all of its neighbors and use a weighted sum or attention mechanism to weight the importance of the node's neighbors. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. So does that mean you cannot use a GCN for inductive settings or um, can they be adapted for inductive settings as well? Um, yeah, you can still use it for inductive settings uh, for GCN, for this particular GCN variant uh, because it is an approximation of the, the graph Laplace uh, filter. Um, however, it, because um, all the experiments empirically, um, GCNs are uh, performed much worse in inductive settings compared to these special uh, spatial GNNs. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and maybe for the benefit of our audience, you can also briefly say what is the difference between inductive and transductive. Right, yes. So in transductive setting, um, you have uh, you have one single graph, and uh, so for example, you have uh, a giant graph of um, the population where the nodes are like uh, 
people in the social network and the edges are like the interaction between these uh these these people and the task would be to predict um for each each person or each node um like what is their let's say uh, what is their preference of of a movies or things like that yeah and in inductive settings uh, usually you have more than uh, one graph like for example um you can um so for example in protein protein interaction settings um one protein could sorry um several proteins could form one graph and then um you are predicting a graph based or graph level um prediction task like for example um uh the structure or the function of of a certain protein yeah so next uh let's see what is computational pathology so computational pathology is basically a computational analysis of the gigapixel digital histopathology slides or people often call it whole slide image and there could be a lot of applications of computational pathology, such as cancer grading, tumor detection, cancer subtyping, and survival analysis. So on the uh, left figure, you can see uh, an example of whole slide image. And um, a conventional way of um, computational pathology based on deep learning is that um, Usually, um, the whole slide image is divided into small patches in order to fit into like the memory of GPU, and then uh, a CNN was trained on top of these um, patches independently to get um, patch level predictions. But uh, usually, we we want um, the task is to have a slide level prediction such as um, cancer grading. So. Um, this traditional approach usually aggregates the patch level predictions uh, using simple like uh, some simple mean or max or a more complex um, aggregation method. So you might wonder, since his the pathology slides are images, why would a uh, graph based modeling come into play? So there are two branches of, or two main uh, branches of graph-based computational pathology. One is based on a cell graph. So what is a cell graph? Cell graphs are basically um, um, model cells as a, a graph where the nodes are cells and the edges are cellular interactions within a whole slide image. And some studies also um, use this patch or tissue graph where the nodes are small patches or region of interest and the edges are the relationship between the patches such as um, distance of the patches uh, within the whole slide image or um, other relations. Um, quick question about the okay. cell graph. Mm -hmm. So how... Um... So do you do some, like, do people typically do some pre-processing or segmentation to derive what are cells? Like, how, how does one get the graph? Yeah, yeah, good question. So, yeah, so usually cell uh, nucleate segmentation is performed first to uh, localize the nuclei, and then uh, the cell graph is, is con constructed on top of the nuclei locations. I see. And when you um, when when they talk about cellular interactions here, um, is it the biological interaction that they're talking about, or what cell is adjacent to what cell in the slide? Um, yeah, I so for the next few papers, you will see um, it's it's not that complex. It's more like um, based on their uh, geo geometric distance. Oh, I see. Them. I see. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Sounds good. Okay, so now I'm going to discuss this paper called Cell Graph Convolutional Network. So the motivation behind using cell graph instead of a CNN-based approach is that the overall tissue microenvironment is important in color rectal cancer grading. And uh, as I mentioned before, there are some drawbacks of CNN-based patchwise classification uh, because it does not incorporate the entire tissue microenvironment and 
the specific patch size is actually a problem or data set dependent. Yeah, so in this work, um, the authors proposed uh, cell graphs like shown in this uh, right bottom, bottom right figure. Okay, a quick overview of the method. Um, yeah, like what Nandita uh, asked just now, um, a pre-processing step was performed um, prior to constructing the cell graph. So nuclear segmentation and feature extraction was performed. And then, um, and then after the cell graph construct construction, they passed it through a CGC net, uh, which is a graph neural network to process the cell graphs and uh, to output cancer grading predictions. So nuclear segmentation was performed uh, through an existing model called CIANet, and 17 nuclear features were extracted, such as the mean, standard deviation, and squareness of the nuclear density and, yeah, and other features. And you can imagine like in a whole slide image, there could be um, a lot of nuclei. So in order to reduce the number of nodes in the graph, um, they performed nuclear sampling. So they, they used a combination of furthest point sampling plus random sampling to uh, reduce the number of nodes. And you can see an example here, um, which shows the second column shows the graph without sampling, which is uh, pretty dense. And uh, the third column shows a random sampling approach. The fourth shows a further sampling approach. And the last one shows a combination of random sampling and further point sampling. Okay, so how is cell graph constructed? Um, so Let's consider this AIJ, which is um, uh, an adjacency matrix or whether, whether or not there's an edge between node I and J. So there's an edge between node and I and J if J is within the KNN or K nearest neighbor of I and their distance is uh, within a threshold. Otherwise, there is no edge. So we can also see some examples here of um, different, different grade tissues and their associated cell graphs. And this is an overview of the network architecture. So there are two main components that um, are proposed um, in this network. So first is adaptive, adaptive graph stage. And the next is a graph clustering, which I will go more into more details later. All right. So what is graph adaptive graph stage? Uh, um, quick question before you move on to the mm -hmm. methods. So in the graph, so all the edges are undirected and they do not have any edge weights or anything. It's just yeah, one or zero. That's a, yeah, it's just a, it's a undirected, uh, unweighted graph. I see. And the node features are all the features extracted from the nuclei sampling. Yes, yes. Okay. There are 17 features, I believe. Got it, okay. Okay, so they propose an adaptive graph stage, which is an extension of a uh, graph stage. So the idea or motivation is that um, because uh, one can imagine that cells or hypothesize that cells interact with nearby cells more. So we want to capture um, the local uh, topology around a cell. Yeah, so however, uh, the regular graph stage um, aggregates all the K-hop neighbors um, using the same weight. So it's, it's unweighted. Uh, it aggregates all the K-hop neighbors um, in the same way. However, um, in this adaptive graph stage, uh, what they do is they try to aggregate K-hop neighbors with different weights by passing through um, the hidden representations of the K-hop neighbors um, into a bi-directional LSTM. And then uh, it will, the bidirectional LSTM will output or we will get um, like a hidden uh, embedding for a sequential embedding for each neighbor. And then a weighted sum is performed on these embeddings to get uh, the node embedding. What value of K do they choose here? Um, 
Good question. Uh, I don't remember exactly. Um, yeah, I think it is. It should be detailed in the experiments, but I don't remember exactly. Um, so usually, uh, I, people usually use like one hop or two hop or three hop. Yeah, but if you can imagine, like if you go too far away, then mm -hmm. um, it's like yeah, your 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 neighborhood will be uh very dense. So, um. Okay, graph clustering. So um, if you recall from the architecture of um, the, the CGC net, uh, there, there are graph clustering layers uh, in, between, um, in, in between the different hidden layers. So what this graph clustering layer is doing is that um, it, it um, preserves, it tries to preserve the hierarchical structure. So uh, remember that this is a, a slight level grading problem. So it is a graph classification problem. However, traditionally, um, how graph classification or graph representation is obtained is through aggregating the node representations from the GNN. So the hierarchical structure is lost here. Um, instead, the authors used graph clustering layer to group nodes and um, form a new graph as inputs for the next GNN layer. Yeah, so you'll see like a graph sage layer here that uh, basically gives you a node cluster assignment and adaptive graph sage uh, gives you a node hidden embeddings. And then um, when they pass through a graph clustering layer, you will get a new graph, uh, which is no longer the original self graph, but a, 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 like a, a clustered or like the nodes are clustered into different clusters. Yeah, so, and in the end, uh, the final representation is actually the concatenation of the hidden representations from the three stages. So um, they, yeah, they used three adaptive graph stage layers here. And then, um, yeah, the final representation is obtained through concatenation of these different stages. Okay. Let's look at uh, their experiments. They use um, color rectal cancer data set, which contains around uh, 139 WSIs. And there are three classes um, for classification, normal, low grade, and high grade. And for the nuclear segmentation training, they, they trained the model on um, a separate data set called color rectal nuclear segmentation and phenotypes data set. And first, they performed an ablation experiment. So uh, recall that um, there are 17 node features in total, which uh, include the appearance and spatial relation in the nuclei. And, um, and there is also like a graph sage versus adaptive graph sage, or whether or not they want they use adaptive graph sage as, as the GNN layer and different uh, nuclei sampling methods. So uh, they find that um, their approach, which basically leverage all the node features, including the appearance and spatial relation in the nuclei, uh, adaptive graph stage, as well as a fusion of um, both furthest point and random sampling give the best uh, performance compared to other combinations. And their method also outperforms other, other uh, state-of-the-art or prior state-of-the-art state-of-the-art methods. Okay, so remember there are uh, two graph clustering layers in the CGC net. So here shows um, the cluster assignment in, yeah, cluster assignments. So we can see that the middle column is the first cluster assignment, which is uh, basically um, assign us the raw or like aggregate the raw uh, cell graphs um, into different clusters. And then the last column shows a second cluster assignment, which, uh, is, which contains um, fewer clusters, but more nodes or more uh, nuclei in, within the same cluster. Okay, any question here so far? 
do they give any interpretation for what a cluster actually could mean? Um, no, they didn't really give interpretation here. Um, but from what I see here, uh, I think the the nearby the nearby cells are mostly clustered together. <laughs> yeah, and you can see like a pretty nice uh spatial structure here. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, what is your purpose here? You want to like apply this this one for segmentation, or or I, I'm not sure if I got that part. Oh, sorry, which one? This, this. Yeah, so you want to apply this method for um, implementing the segmentation for the regions, or how do you see it like proceed further, other than visualization, right? Oh, you mean this this entire yeah. paper? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, no, actually, uh, because this this uh this is for the task of uh cancer okay. grading okay other rectal cancer grading so okay. they actually show quantitatively that their method performs um better than the oh, okay than other methods that i believe this this these methods are uh, uh cnn based methods or patchwise methods okay yeah okay. and here they are not using any patches right they are directly computing the features from the original resolution image data right right yes so this is on the the whole slide image okay and, the, and do, do they do any kind of like um uh, image um dimensional reduction for the huge images or they're actually calculating this graph from the original image resolution um yeah the original image resolution is the same but they performed a nuclear sampling to reduce the number of nodes oh, okay okay yeah because um yeah because within a whole slide image there could be a lot of uh, cells right. yeah okay um yeah let's move on to the next paper so this is another paper uh, on graph based modeling and similar motivation um so there there are some drawbacks of patch level analysis um especially um because like patch level provides very limited visual context and it's hard to choose uh, to decide which what is the optimal patch size here. Yeah. Okay, an overview of the method. So similar to the previous paper, um, the authors also performed nuclear localization and classification first before they construct the graph. Um, however, the, the graph is constructed slightly different um, because they they do a spatial clustering first to first um, cluster uh, some cells together, and then the graph is constructed on top of the clusters. And similarly, nuclear uh, segmentation is done through an existing model called HoverNet. And um, through this HoverNet, they were able to get a nuclear loc location type and features. And an agglomerative clustering was performed to um, group neighboring nuclei into the same cluster. So here shows an example of uh, what the clusters look like. And finally, they construct the graph. Um, so the nodes are no longer cells, but clusters here. And the node features are the nucleotide type count and the standard deviation of nucleotide size. So there are around seven features here. And the edges are, um, are selected based on the delaunay triangulation of the geometry centers of the cluster. So what is, what is this triangulation? Um, it basically means that um, there's no point inside, no point is inside the circum circle of any triangle. And you can see an example graph here. For the graph neural network, they used an existing graph isomorphism network, um, which is expressed here. Um, so basically what the gene, uh, the case layer of gene um, aggregates um, is the one's node, uh, node's neighbor, and then um, add together um, its its own uh, hidden representation from the previous layer, and then pass it through a multi-layer perception to get the updated representation.
yeah oh, um quick quick question yes um do they do any sampling or do they use all the clusters um in 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 this graph no they yeah they use all the clusters um so i think um once they do the clustering um the nodes uh, they didn't really mention how many clusters are there but mm -hmm. i'm sure uh the the graph is not or the mm -hmm. number of nodes are yeah not that big as to as compared to like the number of cells in the mm -hmm. whole slide image okay so for this uh, in this paper um they use this cancer genome atlas in breast cancer data set and there are two tasks the first one is to predict um, this her2 receptor positive versus negative where her2 positive um, breast cancer actually grows and spreads faster and another prediction task is uh, predicting pr positive versus negative pr is an important biomarker for breast cancer and uh, this is like quantitative results of the two prediction tasks where the method one and method two are like previous state of the art, um, but patch-wise or patch-based methods. And they also visualize the node features. So remember that there are uh, seven features used in this study or seven uh, nuclear features. And how they visualize it, it is uh, they first perform PCA to reduce the dimension from seven to three. And then these colors uh, just represent um, the feature or the value of these features. And we can see that um, HDR2 negative um, actually has like more blue colors here compared to HDR2 positive. And in the paper, they provide a few more examples of uh, comparing between negative versus positive. Um, yeah, I didn't show it here, but if you're interested, you can um, refer to the paper. All right, any question here? If not, uh, I'll move on to the next paper, which is um, slightly different, uh, different application or like different problem. So this paper tries, aims to address the quantification or quantifying explainers of graph neural networks in the context of computational pathology. So um, the motivation behind is that um, explainability can always help explain the decisions of, um, of the deep learning model to pathologists, but um, previous pixel level explanations for deep learning models as shown here. Um, there are some drawbacks um, in computational pathology for this type of uh, explanations. Uh, first is that um, the, it degrades biological tissue entities uh, as well as the interaction between these entities. And also the, uh, the explanation tends to be blurry. So you can see in this figure, um, it doesn't really tell you which specific cell or like um, yeah cellular interaction that contributes the most, whereas it only shows like a general pretty uh, big area of uh, importance. And also, uh, so far, most of the explainability studies in computational pathology is is pretty qualitative. So uh, usually, people just show some. Um, images or like some uh, explanations um, as, as uh, saliency maps or occlusion maps, uh, where um, if you really want to interpret um, this type of um, saliency maps, you require a lot of uh, domain ex ex specific expertise. So the paper, uh, the, the other thing that um, explainability in computational pathology should be in the biological entity space using graphs rather than in the imaging space. And they also propose some quantitative metrics. Okay, um, here shows the overview. Um, it's it's a very busy figure, but 
what it's uh, the the main uh, main method behind is that um, first um, they obtained or they trained a graph neural network for a specific uh, specific classification problem such as um, cancer subtyping, and then they use this trained graph neural network together with explainability technique to um, show or to obtain some quantitative metrics. Um, as well as uh, some qualitative visualization. Okay, so in this paper, they call it entity graph, but it's basically cell graph here. And the methods of, uh, of constructing cell, cell graph is very similar to the first paper we discussed. So they also performed a uh, nucleus segmentation first and extract uh, node features. Well, the node features here um, include visual attributes from a pre-trained ResNet, as well as some spatial attributes like, uh, like the, yeah, the nucleus centroid uh, normalized by the patch dimension. And similarly, the edges are uh, based on the k nearest neighbor of a node. And the graph training was uh, done using graph isomorphism network for classifying cancer subtypes. And they also um, studied four different post hoc graph explainers. So um, yeah, graph LRP is basically an extension of um, layer wise relevance propagation, which assigns an important score to each neuron in the GNN aggregation step. And graph GradCam and graph GradCam++ is an, are an extension of uh, GradCam um, by computing the gradient of the predicted logits with respect to the GNN layer. And finally, a uh, GNN explainer is a graph pruning approach that aims to find a subgraph GS that maximizes the neutral information between GNN prediction of uh, the whole graph versus the subgraph. Yeah, so this, uh, these explainers are, uh, are all extensions of existing methods. And they all give a uh, node level importance. So they, it, uh, it assigns an important score to each node in the graph. Okay, um, in order to obtain their uh, quantitative metrics, um, we need to define some terminologies here. So first we need a uh, node importance obtained from the explainers. And we also need a set of concepts that we are interested in, as well as a set of attributes associated with the concept. So what is a concept? For example, you can say a nuclear shape is a concept that a, the pathologist might be interested in. And the attributes associated with concept nuclear shape could be the parameter roughness and circularity of nuclear. And uh, since this is uh, this paper is uh, mainly focusing on uh, cancer subtyping, so we also need a set of tumor subtypes and a set of thresholds for the number of important nodes. So once we have uh, the node importance and all other uh, definitions, we can obtain one histogram for each tumor subtype, concept, and threshold of the number of nodes. So these histograms shown here are, um, in the x-axis, it is the normalized node importance. Uh, so the value is uh, between zero and one. And the y-axis is the number of cell graphs. And uh, the histograms are converted to a probability density function in order to compute the quantitative matrix later. Then they propose a separate separability score. Um, so basically what this separability score is doing is um, tells you how separated um, one class is to the other class um, from, from, the, from the trends GNN as well as the explainability uh, explainer. 
So in the third last row, you will see a definition of separability score for tumor subtype TX and TY, uh, with respect to a certain um, attribute A. And they compute this separability score using Wasserstein distance. And to get the separability score for the concept, they aggregate across all the attributes. And finally, in order to get the separability score for um, across, uh, across all the thresholds, they aggregate it um, using the area under, under the curve um, across different important nodes threshold. And you also, they also aggregate across different concepts to get a final, uh, yeah, final separability score between tumor subtype TX and tumor subtype TY. And there are also uh, three different ways of um, doing that. One is uh, take the max of all the concepts and uh, or average of all the concepts as, uh, as well as the correlation between the separability score uh, and the pathologist prior. So what this pathology prior is, uh, is obtained is um, they ask three pathologists to rank, rank the concepts that they think are most important to discriminate subtype X and subtype Y. And finally, they uh, have an overall metric that um, basically um, they define the conceptually define a risk score that um, assigns a risk of misclassifying tumor subtype TX to TY. So for example, um, if let's say a normal or subtype one is misclassified to subtype three, then uh, they define it, the risk score as two because there, there's two class hop from subtype one to subtype three. Okay, and yeah, this data set, um, this study is based on this breast cancer subtyping data set. And there are three classes, uh, three classes for subtyping benign, atypical, or malignant. And the authors first show qualitative assessment of the explained of the four different explainers. So in these figures, you can see um, the colors means nucleic importance. So the red, red color, I believe red color means uh, more in higher importance than a blue color. And uh, each, each dot is basically a nuclei. And we can see that all the explainers um, actually give pretty similar um, importance or consistent region importance. And graph LRP gives the least interpretable importance score or in, uh, importance map, uh, because you can see that in this example, for example, um, the important nuclei are very, there are only a few nuclei that are very important and they are like uh, clusters in this, in this small region. Whereas uh, for the second and the last example, uh, the important nuclei are like scattered around the whole image. And we can also see that graph graph cam and graph graph cam plus plus give pretty similar interpretability maps. Okay, for quantitative assessment. So uh, this here, the numbers here show the separability score between two subtypes or two classes. So for example, uh, this column here shows the separability score between benign and atypical tissues. And the higher score, the better, because uh, the higher separability score means that uh, the classes are more, uh, more distinguished by the, by the model and the explainer. So some observations here. Um, we can see that genome explainer has um, higher higher separability score compared to 
uh, grad camp and grad camp plus plus, except for the last metric, which is um, performing the correlation between uh, between the the explainer separability and the pathologists um, con pathologists or how pathologists think the concepts should be ranked. And another interesting observation is that the higher um, higher accuracy actually is um, is related to better separability. So you can see benign versus malignant um, has the highest accuracy. And it also has the highest separability score in this case. Yeah, and also explainers had similar relevance um, to the con relevance of concept as pathologists for discriminating like benign versus malignant or benign or atypical versus malignant, but um, different different relevance compared to pathologists in discriminating benign versus atypical um, because we can see the correlations here are negative. And here are some overall metrics. Again, we can see that uh, GN explainer performs or has the highest separability score except for the correlation based metric. And they also did an ablation study that compares a per concept metric from the GNN explainer. So, uh, so basically, they find that um, tumors or nucleus size is the most important concept in this case because it gives the highest separability score, uh, which is. I think, although I'm not a pathology, but I think it uh, makes sense um, that like the size of the nuclei could could possibly tell something about uh, whether whether the tissue is benign or like uh, has malignant cancer. Okay, any question about this paper? All right, so. Uh, some personal takeaways. Um, so graph-based modeling can be more useful than patchwise standard-based modeling if um, if it is important to capture the entire tissue microenvironment or cellular interaction. And however, I feel that this uh, this could be problem and domain dependent. Uh, so based on yeah, depending on whether the problem, uh, whether the tissue in environment is important in, in a specific domain. And um, from all the three papers we have seen, actually uh, domain expertise still plays an, a key role here um, in terms of like defining the, the node features using the nuclear features or like defining, like for example, the last paper um, about defining the quantitative metrics. Yeah, so domain expertise or like pathologist expertise still plays a key role in this, in this field. All right, that's it. Do you have any question? Thanks so much, C. Um, yeah, let's open the floor for questions. Um, I have a question more. Um, do you know if in the paper they discussed maybe doing the opposite of instead of using concepts and trying to find the features, they try to maybe see new concepts or uh, new patterns that might be indicative of benign versus malignant? Um, like a feature discovery, sort of? Um, no, in this specific paper, they didn't do that. So um, that's why I think domain expertise still plays a key role in this, in this particular study because um, look at how they define, uh, I guess it's this, this table. Um, yeah, they define this set of concepts and their attributes. Um, I think it's pretty dependent on like, yeah, the, the domain expertise. So um, like they, they know that nuclear size and shape and like shape variation would be um, important in like cancer grading or cancer subtyping. Yeah. 
But yeah, like what you suggested, uh, it would be interesting to to see like the other way around, like how a uh, uh, explainer, general explainer, could help discover new concepts or new features that have not been uh, widely used in cancer subtyping. Thank you. Um, I have one question as well. Mm -hmm. um, do any of the papers talk about um, how much compute they need um, because the number of nodes is pretty large and do they see any computational advantages in modeling as a graph versus um, patch-based modeling? Uh, though they didn't really specifically mention the computational advantage. Um, yeah, so, but I believe uh, it's not a problem in these studies um, because in, um, in, in most of the graph, like graph-based studies, um, the number of nodes are like, could be like thousands of nodes and still it doesn't, there, there won't be a computational issue with our current uh, GPUs. Mm -hmm. And even if uh, the graph is huge, like, uh, I don't know, millions of nodes, um, there are also like um, graph neighborhood sampling techniques that can be used um, when, like, when training the graph neural networks. Like basically it, um, instead of, instead of um, aggregating the information from all the neighbor, neighbors of a node, graph uh, neighborhood sampling basically samples a subset a subset of the neighbors, yeah. Any other questions? Um, so I joined a little bit late, but I think uh, the first paper you covered uh, mentions more about using the graph CNNs for pathology, right? Or... Um... Uh, the gigapixel one, yeah. The sorry, this one, this one. Uh, yes. Okay, which slide you do you want to go to? Oh no, I, I was just curious. So they kind of covers more how you would go about implementing a graph CNN for pathology, right? Um. Yeah. So I would say the graph construction mm -hmm. methods are pretty similar across the three studies. So they first do nuclease segmentation to find the locations of the nuclei and also extract uh, nuclei related features. And then they construct the cell graph. Um, yeah, where the nodes are the cells and the edges are like the ge geometric distance between these cells. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions? I guess if not, then we can thank C with some virtual applause. Um, thanks again, C, for presenting. I think it was pretty good, um, like a good overview of all the methods currently in this field. And we will put up the um, video in our YouTube channel um, tonight. And if you have more questions or discussions, you can contact C or put it on our Google form uh, as questions as well. Okay. okay see you next Thank week. you. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.